Hey podcast family, welcome to another episode of The Period Party. This week I am talking to Dr. Meg Mill about hormonal headaches and migraines, particularly why they happen, why they happen at certain times in the cycle like before your period and during ovulation, and can we really fix them permanently? Dr. Meg is a functional medicine practitioner, best-selling author, speaker, and host of the podcast, A Little Bit Healthier, where she discusses things you can do every day to live a healthier, more fulfilled life. In her virtual functional medicine practice, she works with patients worldwide to heal the root cause of their health struggles through advanced diagnostic testing and personalized support. Dr. Meg has a free gift for those of you who are listening and struggling with headaches. It's called The Eight-Step Guide to Say Goodbye to Headaches Naturally, and you can find it at helpmyheadaches.com. Enjoy this episode. Hey, Meg. It's so nice to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be such a good conversation because... Headaches are ubiquitous. I mean, I feel as though as someone who really hasn't had a lot of headaches in their life, I count myself lucky, uh, but I've heard so many times from clients over the years that they're struggling with headaches at different times in their cycle, or they're just prone to migraines and what do they do? And I feel like there is, you know, the conventional approach to headaches is just kind of like, well, let's treat the pain and that's really it. And so I'm really excited to, to dive deeper into this topic with you today. Yes. And I think what you're saying is exactly right. It's become normalized. People think, oh, I just have headaches when you don't, and they think they have to, or just have to cover up the pain when you don't need to. So it really can make a huge difference. Oh, totally. I completely agree. And, you know, I would love for you to actually talk about this because I know you have an experience with uh, conventional medicine where you didn't feel great, but you, all your test results were fine and you were kind of told you were fine. And is that kind of what got you into doing this work? Yeah. So I was in conventional medicine for a lot of years and I was feeling like I just, I knew there was something wrong. And I hear this over and over again, where you're like, oh, you're the picture of health and your labs look normal, which we'll use in quotation marks <laughs> because we know the difference between optimal and normal. Um, but you feel like everything is like looking okay, but you still feel lousy all the time and you just can't get answers. And here I am in the medical space and I'm going to different specialists and I'm just like, okay, you're fine. You're healthy you're good and you're and you don't know what's going on and that's what really led me to make the change into to functional medicine because I just wasn't able to get those answers that I knew I had that intuition you know you don't feel well and you want mm -hmm. answers and you're being told that you're healthy when you don't feel that way so once you really can find the root cause and and really heal yourself and find and get your your labs optimal and everything and all your nutrients balanced you can feel your best and have the energy you deserve to live with Oh yes, girl, tell me about it. I know as someone who also struggled for a long time dealing with, you know, all manner of birth control side effects and being told everything looks fine. <laughs> You're the picture of health, even though I had never felt sicker in my whole life. It, I mean, it's so tremendously frustrating. It's like this weird gaslighty type of thing that you go through and you really start to think you're losing your mind. I definitely thought I was crazy for years. Yes, I know. And it, it, see, I hear you. It's like psychological when you, I, I know I don't feel fine. I'm being told I am. And I, you buy that someone you trust, you know, you're going to those providers because you trust their knowledge and their experience and you want answers and you're being shut down and told go, you know, go home or, or take a medication to just kind of cover up symptoms that, you know, aren't really the root cause of what's going on. Yep. I did that for a long time as, as the case for many of us. Um, and so when it comes to headaches, as we know from a conventional perspective, they're just about the head, they're about the pain, like I was saying, and about treating you know, those symptoms. Whereas from the functional medicine perspective that you take, uh, there's so much more to it, right? There's way more going on in the body. So how, as a functional medicine practitioner, are you uh, working with someone or treating them differently than they might be treated in a conventional setting? 
So for, I like to use the analogy of a car. So if you took your car to a mechanic and you said, my car's making a noise, there's something wrong with it. And the mechanic walked away and they gave you, they handed you a pair of headphones and your keys back and said, here, go away, drive the car. And you're like, um, no, I don't feel comfortable doing that. You're just covering it up. And we wouldn't accept that. But that's essentially the way we're treating headaches conventionally. We're giving pain medication to treat the symptoms and cover up the pain so that you're not experiencing the pain when you have a headache headache, but you're not really making all of the connections to why that headache's occurring. So what we do is we like flip the model upside down and we look at your body as a whole. We look at all the connections and we want to see what's going on in the body. Like, do you have a hormone imbalance? Do you have, are you nutrient deficient? Do, are you reacting to certain foods? Do you have stress levels that are, you know, your cortisol out of control? Do you, are you, you know, have a higher toxic load? And, and once we put all those pieces to the puzzle together for someone, then the headaches go away. And then they don't have to take the medication. They don't have to deal with the covering up the pain because they're not getting the headaches all the time. And, and I think the other aspect to this that people aren't talking about is like a lot is the side effects that come from those medications too, because it's not only the pain of the headache, but sometimes, you know, people were even coming to me with side effects and other problems from having to take these medications long-term too. Yeah. Can we talk a little bit about that? Like what side effects are we looking at from, like I said, I, I don't really have a whole lot of um, experience personally with headaches or the medications involved. Uh, so I'm curious, like, what are those side effects if you're taking them long-term, which I imagine many people are. Yeah. So the, I mean, the most common things people are using generally for their headaches, if they don't have like severe migraines or things that where they're on prescription medications would be Advil or Tylenol. And so when you're taking right. something like an NSAID, which is, you know, Advil, naproxen, things like that, that, that would be like a leave or um, ibuprofen the generic name for the Advil. If you're taking those things on a regular basis, then you're actually getting a lot of side effects. Like you're getting the gut lining, you know, that, that has a strong effect. We know, and this data, the interesting part is this data is from pharmaceutical data. It's not from like holistic health or anything. You know, we know there are side effects that that Advil can disrupt the gut lining. And then we get into that leaky gut, you know, all those other things that then that, you know, it almost creates this roundabout. You get the food sensitivities because you have the leaky gut, which increases inflammation, which can then increase pain and we can get in this. But, you know, then there are additional risks like cardiovascular risks we know go up and different things, you know, liver toxicity, um, Tylenol is one of the biggest causes of liver toxicity and, you know, um, overdose in that way. So we just want to be careful, you know, if you're taking these on a regular basis. So I would say if you're taking them more than really a few times a year, you need to think, why am I taking these? Is it, is it a regular thing? Is it something I'm using on a regular basis that could be having other impacts on my health? Wow. A few times a year. I'm sure people who are listening to this might be shocked by that because that's not a lot <laughs> times a year. It's so interesting. I have two things with that. The first is I recently had tongue and lip tie surgery, which just was really intense. <laughs> and the, you know, the after effects of it and just the recovery and all of that. And I had to take Tylenol right after, which I've never found has been particularly helpful for me personally. I much prefer the NSAIDs. And so I had to take Tylenol and codeine and things like that. And uh, my husband went into the pharmacy to get me some Tylenol and he sees these bottles that have like a thousand pills in them. And he was like, who is buying those? And I'm like, the people with the migraines and the chronic headaches, <laughs> clearly, right? <laughs> Cause you're just, you're just in it. And you just gotta, you know, you gotta just like do whatever you can to avoid that because I just know how debilitating they can be when they start. Exactly. And I do agree. Like once you're in that pain and there, you, you don't fault anyone for wanting to take the pain medication to cover it up because you need to get through. It is painful. It disrupts your life. So really our goal is to get them down. So you're not getting the headaches. So you don't, that, that doesn't have to be a part of your life anymore. Yeah, for sure. I completely agree. And it was really interesting what you said about the research showing that, you know, Tylenol, um, acetaminophen is such a, such a problem for our livers. Cause that's, that's what I grew up hearing. I always remember being told like, don't take more than a certain amount because it could really impact your liver. And do you feel like people really understand that generally speaking? 
No, I think that when things are over the counter, people generally have an, a feeling of safety. It's like, oh, I can just buy that off the shelf. So it's safe for me. It must be safe for me to take because I can just pick it up and buy it. And, and they're not really paying attention to necessarily how often they're using it or the dosage limits that they're using. And, and the other thing is, you know, we weight base dose for kids. And so we also we're looking at the dose based on the weight and the size of the person. Well, when you look at an average adult, the weight base is very different. So we're all just bucketed into the same level of, you know, medication that we're taking no matter what weight we are and, and sometimes like the size mm -hmm. of people and everything are different too so all there's so many factors that can play a role and it's like I think just being able to just go in and grab it off the shelf is a false sense of security so it's, it's just paying attention to like how often are you using these medications and and really being aware that there are things that can be happening in your body because you're using them regularly yeah I know awareness. Um, okay. And then what about, so you mentioned, obviously you take a very different approach and you talked about our gut health and our livers and environmental toxins and all of these things. So maybe we can start with diet and its role in headaches, because I'll hear something along the lines from a client of, well, I ate so-and-so and, -so and it, you know, the next day or within six hours, I, I had a migraine and before I never really used to put those two together, but when they start paying attention. So I'm curious, like what, what's going on with our diets that might be contributing to chronic headaches or migraines? Yeah. So there's two different elements when it comes to diet. So we have foods we know for sure have data supporting that they can cause headaches and in, in like functionally for people. And so those are things like histamine foods, tyramines, salicylates, um, aspartame, even caffeine. Caffeine sometimes is used to treat headaches, but it can also cause rebound headaches for people from a withdrawal symptom. But the, the trick there is that those um, foods don't cause headaches for all people. So not every one of those foods cause headaches for every person. So it's really about finding your unique triggers. So when I'm working with people, we'll often say like, okay, we'll give like almost like a washout period where we, you know, we just eliminate them all for a short period of time and then reintroduce to see what is their particular trigger. It can also be a little more complicated because it can be more than one food. So sometimes if you're having, let's say a tyramine containing food, you're, you're like, so we'll use wine, for example. So, cause people I was just going to ask you a glass of wine. Yeah. So they yeah, say like, what oh, are tyramines? Yeah. yeah. Can you and share I, what those foods are? Like what are some yeah. of them? Okay. Yeah, so, sure. So we, so that would be like the, um, the tyramines would be like the wine and like the aged, some aged cheeses. We have nitrates, which are hot dogs and things like bacon. We have things that are the histamine foods would be like fermented foods, avocados, actually histamine food, which surprises people. Sometimes everyone so sad. <laughs> has, yes. <laughs> and then, and then sal salicylates can be found in citrus foods. We even like MSG is another one that can be in like canned processed foods, aspartame would be in diet sodas and things like that. We can, and then look for like artificial colorings and flavorings sometimes too can, can be triggers for people. So, but if you're, so let's say you're having one of those, like, you know, a food that has that, but you are, ha are okay sometimes, but then you would have it again. And you're like, well, it shouldn't be that because I had that before and it didn't cause a headache, but it, it can sometimes be a threshold. So maybe you're eating more of it or drinking more of it or having two foods that both are triggering you. So sometimes it can be a little bit tricky there. And what I will often have people do then is just write down the foods if they get the headache or migraine, write down what they ate that day and the day before. So you can start looking for connections to what's triggering you individually. And so that's a place because it is, it's almost like I, we become detectives in which food are your unique triggers. So you're not eliminating, because we don't want to eliminate all of these foods and we don't have to, but it's really figuring out individually. So then the other thing is food sensitivities and that's unique to um, each person. So that's when you're getting that leaky gut and in your getting the food permeating in, you know, two large of pieces through the, uh, the um, intestinal lining and your body starts having an immune response with these IgG antibodies. And so um, people have those individual food sensitivities. So food sensitivities can happen four to 48 hours after ingesting the food, which is why we look at like the day before and the day of the, the start of the headache, because it could potentially be something you ate the day before. Okay. I feel like that was so helpful. And I would love to talk about um, the other 
factors that play a role because I think something like stress, we hear this all the time, right? Stress is bad for you. <laughs> Too much stress is killing you. Uh, and I, I think that it's gotten such a bad rap in, and in fact, really we should be figuring out how to work with the stressors in our lives and, and how to mitigate the stress rather than being so focused on cutting it out of our lives. Cause that's clearly not happening anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, so I would love to talk about sort of like the mechanism, like what's happening with stress or stressors, and how um, that manifests as chronic headaches. Yes, and you know, you put before we. Uh, I want to. We'll get into the exact mechanism, but I, you put brought up a good point um, about we can't really get rid of the stressors in our life, and they're here. And um, your cortisol levels go up in relation to perceived stress. So Gosh. that changing mindset is huge here because <laughs> we talk about that all the time. Of it's a perceived stress, not actual stress. So just even getting that mindset shift can be can be huge in headaches too. So what? Yeah. So I cut like to call it the chain um, of pain because pain in itself is a stressor on our body. And so when we're getting the stress from the pain, you can get these in increased cortisol levels, which is your stress hormone. And then cortisol, having high cortisol can actually increase prolactin, which is another hormone and prolactin increase can increase pain sensitivity. So then the stress can increase your sensitivity to the pain, increasing more stress on your body. And so we can get in this cycle of pain, you know, in this like, okay, I'm having the pain, which is creating more stress. Which, and, and, and again, it's also stressful in our life to have the pain because a lot of these headaches, especially when we're getting migraines are interfering with things. You know, you have your daughter's birthday party planned and everyone's coming to your house and that's the day you get a migraine or you're on vacation and you're so excited and your migraine strikes. I hear those stories all the time, unfortunately. So, you know, we we have to really focus on trying to manage the, you know, our overall stress, manage our cortisol levels, really try to do the things we can do to get ourselves back in that parasympathetic nervous system, in that place of resting and digesting in order to, to really regulate our cortisol levels. So, you know, things I'm, you know, you're like saying, talking about people, we have to talk about this all the time. There's a lot of stress, but really I like to say, find things that resonate with you. If you can take a few minutes out of your day and do something, I could say, okay, you need to meditate or you need to deep breathe, or, but that may not work for you in your life or be what really calms you down. And I think it's individual sometimes. So individual. I could not agree more. I mean, I feel as though I talk to friends, people in our wellness world, and they're all like, yeah, you know, I really like this. And, or I really love meditation, or I really hate meditation. And I feel as though sometimes we get boxed in, like we're told to do all these things and it's either overwhelming and even more stressful to think about all these de-stressing techniques that we're supposed to employ in our daily lives. Um, and that's like what you said, it's just finding what works for you. Um, and it could be so many different things. Uh, you know, like for me, I uh, literally just laying on a bolster type pillow, arms back and listening to some binaural beats really is amazing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's just 10 minutes and that feels like a meditation to me. So I'm curious, what, what are some of your favorites? Yeah, I like, I really have like meditation too. I think just getting your mind calm and being able to disassociate from your thoughts and just have that relaxation is helpful. And I've been practicing a long time. So for me, it, it works and I can do it. And, but it did take practice. So I, I think it's one of those practices that, you have to kind of do it on a regular basis and repeat it to get used to it and kind of get over that initial, my mind's racing, I can't stop, I can't stop thinking. So yeah. a lot of times I have people start with a guided meditation in order to get used to it. Yes, I agree. I'm a big fan of the guided meditations. And also too, just like sometimes it's two to five minutes and then you work your way up and this is not something that's meant to be super hard and to ultimately just turn you away from doing it. Um, so I, I always encourage everyone to just start with like five minutes. What can you do for five minutes to, like you said, disassociate from all the things that are happening in your life so that you can get that release. And I think the other thing is too, is that it may feel hard now, but late, if you, the later, the longer you wait to do these things, the more the problem becomes pronounced in your body. Would you agree? 
Absolutely. Yes. And I, I'm with you. I said, you know, if you can, who can't do two to five minutes, really? Right. right? <laughs> and yeah. I say just daily. And, the, and I think doing it regularly is more important than doing it more. So you yeah. get that used to it. You build that muscle so that your body knows how to calm down and you, you really can bring it back in when you're in that stressful situation. You know, your body knows what to do and you know how to respond. Totally, totally. And so can we talk a little bit about the hormonal migraines or hormonal headaches? Again, yes. something that yeah. we hear often. I uh, would love to talk about how, you know, why might we be getting headaches at uh, ovulation time and then again before our period or the first day of our period? Like, what's the correlation there? So the most common reasons for hormonal migraines are either estrogen dominance or rapid changes in estrogen. So mm -hmm. if you do notice that you're getting the monthly, so I would say like, look, that's, you know, it, even pulling that calendar back out. And when you're saying like, if you're tracking foods, another thing is like you could track is when you are in your cycle. So if you're like, okay, I know this is something that I get every month, then it most likely for you will be hormonally related, although it can have other aspects. So we look at those, you know, like rapid change in the estrogen or estrogen dominance. So our progesterone, our estrogen and progesterone are both decreasing that last week before the period. And sometimes the progesterone will decrease for people faster than the estrogen, leaving you estrogen dominant. And then that can actually increase um, prostaglandins. And so then those are inflammatory and can actually perpetuate the, the headaches too. So um, we really want to just start doing things that reduce the, you know, in you talk about this a lot with, you know, looking at the balance between estrogen and progesterone. So do you have too much estrogen? Do, do you in fact have low progesterone? So some of the things people can start doing right away though, is just really looking at their environment and in starting to look at the endocrine disruptors in your life. Like, are you using a lot of plastics? Do you buy meat and, you know, in dairy that is hormone free and, and really bringing some of those xenoestrogens around us down mm -hmm. to really help with that progesterone estrogen balance. So in a situation where we ovulate, and then as you know, estrogen drops significantly after ovulation. And for some, it drops more severely than others. Um, is that a potential cause for migraines or headaches as well? Because my understanding is estrogen is quite protective of our brain and our body in general. So I'm just curious about the role of estrogen dropping and headaches. Yes. So that is definitely. And I actually just recently worked with someone who exactly, she knew exactly when she ovulated because she was having that headache every single time. It was like that day she hit, it would ovulate in the, the rapid decrease. And so we work on estrogen, but we work on hormone balancing. But the other thing is like, because our bodies are so interconnected, even sometimes like the food, working on the food sensitivities, working on the gut health, we don't even think about how, you know, you can be getting actually increase estrogen from beta, from beta glucuronidase that's happening from your gut and things like that. So cleaning up other parts of your body and decreasing other inflammation in other ways can also help change those hormone levels and help balance things out for you. So that's why it's like we're looking at this holistic picture of the body and how everything's connected with each other. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I'm curious, have you ever had a case where someone has, you know, works in this kind of field and, you know, they've done a lot of things and they are really knowledgeable. I have a friend who's like this and, and she's tried so many things. And I feel like there's a few other things that I might recommend to her, but um, have you ever had a hard case like that where someone feels like they've tried all the things and, you know, they've taken the gut health approach and they've looked at liver detoxification for their estrogens and checked their progesterone and things like that. And it's still, this is still happening. Like, are there other sort of underlying causes that we might not be looking at um, you know, from even from a functional or holistic perspective? Yes. Um, yes. And no, I think that most of the time when you put all the pieces together, you can get some relief. Now there are structural things in people's lives that you just can't change to. So, you know, yeah. even sending them to like the chiropractor or, you know, sometimes even acupuncture and different things, can, other modalities can help, or, you know, I mean, hopefully they've already, most of the people that reach me have already gone down the conventional road. So they've already yeah. either, you know, had that if, if it's severe enough, like like that had the MRI or had checks that, you know, those are other things you definitely want to 
go through to make sure that there's nothing else going on. But I would say, yeah, I mean, so I guess I would say yes and no. There are definitely people, I think a lot that have most of the people that by the time they're like searching out a functional approach, hopefully this is your first stop, but it's not always. So they've tried a lot of things. And so they, you know, once, but once we get those pieces together, we can usually, we can get the headaches down for the most part. Yeah. I mean, do you feel for the most part that you can resolve headaches for most people and for others, it's just, you're reducing them to a manageable amount? Yes. Yeah. And there will get cases where it's like, oh, wow, you know, I've been having migraines every day for four years and it's like, oh my, yeah, can we change this? And it's really is amazing. So I do want to give people hope that really once we dig into and make these connections, it can just make such a difference for people's lives. Yeah, no, totally. And what about, I know this might not be at all within your area of expertise, but I'm thinking about kids because I, I hear a lot about kids having more headaches. Like I don't ever remember having a headache as a kid, but I I see this and I'm so curious, like, is there something going on there? Is it the same for adults? Well, I think too, like you want to look at their hydration levels. And so making sure that they're staying, that the kids are staying hydrated because that hydration is an independent risk factor for actually for headaches too. So that's another thing people can just do is really pay attention to how much they're drinking. The other thing is our diets have changed a lot, probably since you and I are kids. So I think there's an increase of food sensitivities and different dietary issues. I actually also see, because I, in functional medicine, I don't see people just for headaches. I see them for all different reasons. And I actually also have a lot of kids that come to me with gut health issues. Mm-hmm. So I think there's different, you know, it, I, I have been surprised a little bit about how many young people are suffering. And so um, with both the headaches and the gut health, so I think there's a, could be a correlation too of some of the dietary, you know, are you getting enough of the right nutrients? Uh, you know, are you really get it, you know, having any food sensitivities? Are you staying hydrated? Are they sleeping well? All those things can affect the kids in, in different levels of headaches or migraines. Right. Yeah. That's, that's definitely good to know for anyone who's listening, who has a child with a headache constantly. And what about, um, I know you touched on environmental toxins. And so I'm curious about things like heavy metals and mold toxicity and things like that. Do those play a role? Like, could that be, I know those can be an underlying cause for a lot of problems, but I I'm wondering if you have seen that in your practice too. Yes. So they definitely can impact headaches. So particularly lead and cadmium are heavy metals that are highly associated with headaches, but also really just looking at your overall toxic load at your environment. And another thing, particularly with headaches that also beyond like, you know, mold definitely can cause headaches, but beyond like the heavy metals, the mold, the toxic levels, another thing with headaches that we can look at is allergens. So Mm -hmm. we also want to pay attention to, you know, are you congested all the time? What, you know, what's the level of dust, even put things like putting an air filter in your bedroom to like an air purifier to really clean up some of the air because there is that that histamine connection and the allergy connection with headaches too. So those beyond, you know, the toxicity level is important. And then even looking at the allergens in your environment that you live in too. Yes. Oh, for sure. And what about, I mean, I know there's lots of long-term things that we can do. You've described quite a few of them. Are there immediate things that people can do or practices, foods, drinks, something like that for uh, when a headache is coming on? Because I've obviously, I've heard about caffeine, I've heard about sugar, these things that seem problematic in the long term, but can be a quick fix or as close to a quick fix as you can imagine in the short term. Yeah. So I actually like for that quick fix long is um, essential oils. So something like a peppermint or even lavender, if you can, and, and some of the essential oil companies have blends that are actually specific headache blends. But if you put those on your, you know, if you can put like a peppermint oil on your temples some right away, sometimes that can be enough to start to, to actually help. And like putting then the like a cold or some people prefer cold, some people prefer warm and cold more often, but like a cool cloth on your head and get somewhere where you can actually actually just relax and be more in a darker, quiet place If and actually drinking a glass of water so you can increase your hydration can all help at that start of the headache. Okay. Amazing. And I, like I mentioned caffeine, I'm so curious about caffeine. Is there any, what 
what are your thoughts on that? Like having caffeine, like right as a headache is coming on, does that help? It can help. Yeah, yeah, it can. So really, so you want to just watch that the caf- the mechanism of caffeine. The the problem with the caffeine is actually more the withdrawal of the caffeine causing the headache. So if you're if you, you know, that actually can help in the short term in that immediate, like I'm getting a headache, I need something. If where you want to watch caffeine is if you notice that you're getting headaches, maybe like on the weekend or on when you're away, or things that you may be changing your pattern that maybe you don't have that morning coffee that you're drink coffee like you do at the office. Office or something like that, then maybe you're getting, there can be connections of actually withdrawal of the caffeine causing the headache, but in the short term, it can help the, with the okay. headache. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And is there a mechanism of delivery that you prefer? <laughs> is it coffee? Is it tea? Or like, what do you suggest if someone is like right there and maybe they are trying not to take the medication for instance? Yeah, probably. I mean, the, the highest level of caffeine is a cup of coffee. So that right. would be, if you're a coffee drinker, <laughs> it's kind of, everyone has their own personal preference of caffeine, right? <laughs> yeah, they definitely yes. do. And what are your, I mean, I know I, I just asked this, but what about sugar or like, I know obviously we're not trying to have sugar all day, every day by any means, but is that a potential fix, quick fix for an an oncoming headache or migraine? Well, I wouldn't say sugar as much as caffeine. So sugar would be if if you, you know, sometimes people will notice the sugar if they're having another mechanism, which we're kind of like is a whole, even another topic is hypoglycemia and blood sugar related headaches. So you can actually start getting the headache because you're hypoglycemic. So the sugar would help if you're getting low blood sugar. And so really we want to, in that case, pay attention. It's like another thing you can do when it comes to headaches is really try to regulate your blood sugar because when we're getting those increases and decreases and you're getting the like overload of the sugar and then the crashes that can also cause the headache. So I wouldn't necessarily say sugar would be like a a go-to treatment, but really more regulating that blood, you know, paying attention to regulating your blood sugar in general to help prevent the headaches. Does that make sense? Oh, totally. Yeah, no, I I am 100% (laughs) for that. I was just thinking of someone who is maybe working on regulating their blood sugar and these are headaches that are a result of hypoglycemia that they've been dealing with for a long time and whether a little sugar might help. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, you know, and, and really you can tie because, you know, when you're getting that hypoglycemia, yeah, you also can feel like the sweaty, the weak that, you know, you feel those other symptoms coming on. So if you're in tune with that, you might notice like, oh, okay, I just need some, you know, something and just try to keep it, you know, fruit is a good example of something that has natural sugars too. So right. you don't have to as I grab the candy bar, you could grab something that has more, you know, of a natural sugar too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. I feel like I use sugar across the board and I should have clarified. So thank you for that. Um, is there anything else that you feel would be useful for someone who's dealing with chronic headaches or migraines uh, to know? So I think just three things that I would say that they should do right away that are so like free, easy would be to make sure you're getting enough sleep because sleep is another independent risk factor for headaches. So just, you know, look in the mirror. Are you trying to like, you know, stay up late because you're trying to get things done? Or do you actually have a good, quiet, calm environment that you get good quality sleep? So, you know, getting sleep, staying hydrated, just really paying attention, drinking water throughout the day rather than chugging it at once to really optimize cellular hydration because that's where we see the importance for, you know, when it comes to headaches and then really seeing if you can, if it's something that's regular for you, kind of thinking about that calendar and, you know, starting to track, is there things like, are you getting them when you're, you know, in a certain environment? Are you getting them when you're more stressed? Are they around your period? Are you, what are you eating? Those kind of things to just start pinpointing what's unique for you is helpful. Uh, I mean, knowledge is power. (laughs) Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much. And where can everyone who's listening find your work and find all of this good information? Because I know you have something that's free for people who are dealing with headaches, right? Yes. Yes. So you can go to helpmyheadaches.com and I have a free guide and that that just gets you started with simple steps that you can do to say goodbye to headaches. Um, I'm over on Instagram at it's dr meg mill m-e-g-m-i-l-l. So I'm over there and I actually just started my own podcast called 
out a little bit healthier. So in that podcast, we're just doing little tips that you can use every day in your life to stay um, to stay healthier. But I, I do run a, um, a live program specifically for headaches. So you can find information there at happinessbeyondheadaches.com if, you're, um, if you want to get on a wait list to join that. Too. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much, Meg. This is really helpful. And I am sure that whoever is listening and has been struggling with headaches got so much out of this. So thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. That's a wrap. Be sure to click that subscribe button to join me for more Girl Talk Gone Menstrual in upcoming episodes. But in the meantime, check out my latest period party episode. And if you're looking for a deeper dive into your hormones, go ahead and take my period quiz at nicolejardim.com quiz.